Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Are you going to play this drum? Yes. Okay. I would like you to play something. That's how you call a meeting to order. All right. With the sound of the drum. Give me a pulse. Steady, like the beat. Because in the beginning was the beat, and the beat was the rhythm of God, and the rhythm of God is the harmony of humanity. And where there is harmony, there is peace. Now peace syncopates the beats of the drum. As the drum plays, the syncopation speaks the word, the word of God, yeah, the word of peace. And the word has a rhythm, a rhythm that ignites the souls of humanity and harmonizes all of life. And everything that lives comes in tune with the rhythm of God that was in the beginning, the beat, beating, 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 peace. This drum is a peace. Just wanted to thank you guys for coming out. And we're going to have a good time. We're going to share word, we're going to share in some thought and some expression and some feeling, and we're just going to let, as you say in church, the spirit do as it will, and all be edified and strengthened through the sharing. I want to thank the young black storytellers, Jerry Blue, Tom Carter, Rich McGee, and our pan African student junior poets, and we also want to thank and acknowledge the spirit of Emanita Gay Hawthorne, who has perpetuated the word that has been spread on this campus and throughout this community for many a year. continues, and we're going to continue the beat with a few selections from a freshman from the pan African Student Union, a native of Chicago, and a very, very thoughtful and deep-minded sister. So I'm going to ask Kanisha if she would come and share a couple of thoughts on the beat. Bodies alongside of bodies, chained and destroyed, destined to slavery, must file through the air, but this was not a care to the woman who wondered where her child was. Blood dripping from bodies onto the floor where bare feet rest on top of dirt, blood stained dirt. Release me, I want to be free, free the way I was before I was torn before my mother's arms. Thousands of petals cry in a storm as their ship falls beneath the sea. The brisk water splashed upon their faces and chilled their souls. Petals lost in a sea of ungodly things, too afraid to swim and no familiar place to go. For this is new land, not known to the African man. <laughs> My next selection is called Lucid. The world with its acrid nectar and oppressed sirens has left in my heart a dilapidating residue. The world with its defiled materials and cacophonious lyrics 
has left in my mind a dehumanizing feeling. Many are just too ignorant to see the nakedness of their stupidity. The world, with its indecisive missing links and indicated vengeance, has not yet blinded me. Thank you. consider a mentor and someone that I admire for the act of work that you've done for so many years to continue and perpetuate the word is Tony Carter. perhaps once unknown and identity renewed and quite often I hear people say what is it let me see that they are calling themselves today is it Negro or <laughs> are they colored you know what am I supposed to say are they black or African American gosh they were always changing here we go again so I have from a dear, dear friend of mine, in fact, my sister, a little reply, and it is called The Evolution of the African American. A man came from Mars and wanted to know just what color is a Negro? Well, a Negro used to be black, my friend. That is, till the old master put his two cents in. Hmm. Then we became all shades, my fella. Why, some of us, we became downright yellow. I'm telling you, we became so many different hues. Why, some of us downright got confused, and we started calling all Negroes colored. <laughs> black started taking on a negative tone. We started wishing that our black was gone. Then, a mighty fine fella started shouting out loud, talking about, we all black, and we're supposed to be proud. He gave us a whole new point of view, accustomed us to our darkened hue, and we started making, we stopped making our hair bone straight, went into what we called our natural state. Fist in the air, we would shout out loud, telling the world, we black, uh-huh, <laughs> we black, uh-huh, we black and we proud. We began to search for from whence we came, and that's when we gave ourselves a brand new name, African American. Now is our cry. So, you never have to explain, I never have to explain, what color am I? Thank you. And I, um, Joe, should I share a story at this point? Go ahead. Okay. I'll share a brief story with Let's you. Let's flow. Um, and I'll share a story from a person that we know of as Asa. An African slave who lived in Egypt a long, long time ago. And he gave us so many thoughts and things to remember. Sometimes we share them between each other. We call them wisdom, or we talk about little sayings. 
sometimes attached to the ends of stories that we call morals. Aesop's morals attached to the ends of the stories, which he never wrote down, by the way, have become our life's lessons and the things that we now pass on from one to the other. Do any of you know of any Aesop's morals? Morals? Tales, stories, lessons, observations. Aesop is the guy that said, uh, don't cry over spilled milk. Well, that came from Asa. Long time ago, African <clears throat> slaves working sometimes in the king's courts because he was so clever that they dubbed him the wise man. Aesop gave us lots of things to think about. And here's a little tale that comes from Aesop. It's about an African maiden. An African maiden who was very, very playful. And she had a big imagination. And she was always making up things in her head, in her mind. She would create, <coughs> as she played out in the village, all kinds of things. And she would imagine herself in all kinds of roles. You see, she had a very, very big imagination. And one day, her mother said, I need you to go to market for me. Her mother needed her to take eggs to market. And so she did. And on the way, she played and she dreamt of all kinds of things. And she returned with those eggs. Well, her mother asked her time and time again to go to market. And she really liked doing this because on the way, she could play and imagine herself in all sorts of roles. And each time she went, she took a little longer to go and return. Until one day, her mother said, I need you to go to market. And she gave her a pail of milk. And she took that milk, and she did as many African maidens do, put it on her head. So she set the pail of milk on her head and off to the market she went. Now, you might think that that would be a little bit difficult, a pail of milk on one's head. But in African villages, oh, it is learned as a skill. And in fact, one can carry a pail of milk or actually a basket tightly woven filled with milk on one's head and not spill it for a very, very long time. So this is what she did. And she walked away from the center of her village with her pail of milk on her head. And as she walked, and she was so graceful, and still she began to imagine a few things let me tell them to you. <coughs> As she walked with her pail of milk, knowing that she must take it to the market and trade and bring back provisions for her family, she began to imagine all kinds of things in her head Why she began to see herself as a beautiful queen. She began to imagine all kinds of things. And she said, I'll take this pail of milk to the market, and I will trade this pail of milk for three fine chickens. Yes, that is what I will do. I will trade this pail of milk for three fine chickens at the market. And when I get those three fine chickens, why, they will lay eggs millions of eggs every day those three fine chickens will lay so many many eggs that i will have so much more to share then i will take those eggs to the market and when i get to the market do you know what i will do i will trade those eggs for fabric yes 
gold and silver and make oh all sorts of beautiful fabric and I will take that fabric and I will fashion the most beautiful robes for myself and I will adorn myself with those beautiful robes and I will wear those robes. Yes, I will. The next time I go to the market, I will wear one of those robes, oh, the gold one, with the jewels down the front, sparkly, shimmery, shiny. Oh, I will be so beautiful in that robe that when I walk, all the young men in the village will want to date me. Ah, oh, yes, they will. And they will say, will you go with me? And I will say, oh, no, shoo, 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 shoo. I have not any time for you. <laughs> that is what I will say when I go to the market the very next day. And then I will buy, I will buy more fabric to match my robe. And I will come home and I will make a hat. For each robe, I will make a hat. I will fashion the most beautiful hats of gold and silver and lame, and I will put jewels on them too, and I will fan myself with a beautiful bonnet. And when I go to market with my robe and my matching bonnet, I will walk and I will be so beautiful and all the young men will want to date me and I will say, oh no, no, shoo, you see? I had no time for you, just go away, shoo, shoo. And they will continue to come to me and I'll toss my head like, said to her, don't cry, don't cry over spilled milk. spilled milk. And then she said, and don't count your chickens before <laughs> they hatch. And that is the end of that. <laughs> reflects this time of, of year that we celebrate the history of African people in America. And for young people, you really need to know what people before you have done and the sacrifices they've made that would enable you to do and have the freedom to do the things that you want to do, things that you probably take for granted. There's a poem that um, has an anonymous writer, but I learned this poem when I was in high school because I heard somebody say it and for some reason it stuck in my brain. And the poem says, black power, is this to me? Freedom and equality. Frederick Douglass, set me free, that's the way I love to be. Oh God, can't you see that this man won't let me be? But if I have to fight and die, then let me die by my brother's side. If I can't live and be free, then let my blood run red the sea. Black power. It's a, it's a word that expresses what young people your age were, were going through about 30 years ago the challenges that they faced, and the willingness of sacrifice that they were willing to commit to the first generation of our president, 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 the first generation a poem that I actually found in an old file of the Nina poems. I, I've, seen, I've seen some stuff here. I don't think it has really ever stood it. Uh, and I think I might have a student or two to read that before the night is over. But I found a poem that I haven't seen in a long time. And it's one of my favorite poems. The Depth of My Love goes deeper than any man can dream to explore your physical room. The depth of my love gets underneath the skin 
which Amundra has so richly naturally tanned. The depth of my love uncovers green and blue contacts leave extensions and artificial blush. The depth of my love is wide enough to embrace you and yours with room to spare and more to share. The depth of my love is charity, which is love for those who didn't understand the King James diversion. The depth of my love needs love that is deep and wide, uncovered, natural, and real. The depth of my love is God, Allah, Elohim, El Shaddai, and Jesus, yeah. My love is deep. The depth of my love built the pyramids and the sphinx, healed the sick, raised the dead, still build and heal and end raise. And the depth of my love is time in time, cosmically and eternally, which continues to renew itself in a round. The depth of my love destroyed Rome in a day, which is a thousand years for those who don't understand the day. The depth of my love flows from the Nile to the Mesopotamia to be sure that the world is really upside down. The depth of my love engages creativity and demands Kaumba, a better place for the love which it cannot even contain. The depth of my love can be found on Mars, Venus, Vulcan, Rigel, the galaxy Andromeda and beyond. The depth of my love is time, flowing, building, creating, destroying omnipotently, omnipresently, and omnisciently. Yeah, my love is deep. I'm now going to ask um, one of my favorite people on campus to share a couple of poems. Uh, a brother who probably, I, I predict, in 15 years, 20 years, he's going to be the head of the UN, Secretary General. Uh, currently a sophomore, native of Zimbabwe, tribe Shona, introducing Brother George Kwangwadi. Thank you all. I didn't expect to talk right now, but I was getting myself, you know, psyched up. But um, anyhow, I'll just pray, rise to the occasion, as they say. I think I'll do that. Um, well, before I go into reading what I've been writing just a few minutes ago, I would want to just um, um, tell you where I come from and what I've gone through in order for me to find myself thinking the way I think, the way I speak, or what I speak, so to speak. Um, <laughs> I am from Zimbabwe, as you've heard, and well, it's a struggle being in a, a, in a country where mostly it's run by white people, the economy, everything, infrastructure is run by white people. All you can do as a black man is to follow the, the lead and you don't have anything much that we can say is yours except what your father and mother have, have left you, so to speak, I would say again. And, um, well, as the struggle goes, it's not as if um, we are free. We still have our own struggles that we have to overcome. And as Africans, we are mis understood, misconceived in many ways because we come from uh, courts and courts, a free continent. You, you, the people here think that what we are here for, what when we do our work, when we do what we do, is sort of a boast, so to speak, because as you will know, I mean not to be so stereotypical, but Africans when they come to America, they know that there's a chance for them to succeed and they work very hard for what they have come to do. So it's a typical African nature. We are brought up to work hard and the harder we work, we know that we will make it in life. And uh, as I was saying, I wrote this just a few minutes ago when I was working upstairs and uh, the title is It Makes No Sense. To fight for an illusion elusive in its essence as a struggle. When we, can, when we cannot talk where we are coming from, we cannot know where we are going to. It makes no sense to talk about it. The blood shed, the tears cried, the hearts broken will amount to nothing in the struggle until we know who we are. A people of majestic inheritance 
that's what we are. A people with a, with a rich heritage, a people stronger than any force disdain. The seeds of peace have been sowed, seeds of hate for them. But, it's only but, but within the shape of all this, victory is what we have, and victory we need only to take. Um, why I wrote this poem, uh, why I wrote this poem was, I was talking to Brother Joe about um, how I have said before many uh, speakers and they have talked about the history of um, African Americans within the past 300 years. But as I thought deeper, I knew that African Americans do not start 350 years back. They start thousands of years back. And with that, I have been encouraged at least to say out how I feel because as brothers and sisters, you have the same heritage I have. We share the same, uh, the same common um, platforms. The heritage of the Egyptians is our heritage because we are from Africa. The heritage of most African long, I would say, uh, the ancient of all ancient empires, those that have been classified as the best of all, before even the Western world was there. It's your heritage. Until we know that, we won't stand up straight and with our heads held up high and say, we are a people of majestic heritage and of inheritance that has not more than 350 years of history, but thousands of years of history. With that, energy and we've had our brother and our sister and our sister come up and share some of that and our brother who had the vision of having this program and speaking in February for a culture for our heritage since the beginning one that we simply are not going to allow to die and we have to maintain that I thought about sharing a lot of the struggle, but then I thought, no, I don't want to just only talk about that aspect of the struggle. February is also filled with hearts and things, and we think about love and romance. So I want to share some of that too, because we don't, we don't do that enough. But first, because of the food that we had, I just have to share a poem that I wrote in, um, in my book of poetry that I had dedicated to my father because my father loves to cook. And I used to hang out at his house a lot and still do to eat. And it's called Taste de la Soul. I hope y'all know what I'm talking about. Fried chicken and cornbread dressing, collard greens mixed with smoked ham hocks, cha-cha pickles, chicken and dumplings, pronounced dumplings, chitterlings, Please, the word is what? Chitlins. Chitlins. 
Slap a red saute in Leroy Burns' barbecue sauce, or whoever your daddy is. Hot Louisiana sauce for sizzling buffalo and catfish fried among slices of onion. And don't forget the okra, pig feet, pig ear sandwiches, some spicy dirty rice, macaroni and cheese, real, not crap. Sopping up some <laughs> sweet honey chow if you like cornbread, throw some buttermilk in a glass and go for it. First day of every year, serve some black eyed peas. And oh, what about some grits and gravy for breakfast? Escorted by Fatback, if you dare. Hot biscuits and sorghum, pronounced sorghum. Stick to your ribs kind of food, huh? Blackberry cobbler, pronounced cobbler. Now, Banana pudding, please say pudding. pudding. And sweet potato pie, and it's okay to say potato. Egg, custard, coconut cake, homemade ice cream, just say cream, and so on and so on. And then you gotta wash it down with some red soda water and some already sweetened iced tea. Somebody out there gotta know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Hey. Thanks, man. Hey. Hey. We forget about our food and why we have cellular <laughs> and strokes and indigestions and all that stuff. Okay, it can be done a leaner and cleaner, right? But we must remember those foods and why they are what they are. I go into classrooms and I ask young people, do you know what um, hot liquor is? And it amazes me when I see African-American children go, huh? and usually the European-American children will say, oh yeah, that's when you got some pot, you know, like drugs, <laughs> and some liquor, you know, like alcohol. No, children, no. It's the nourishment, the nutrients that our ancestors were raised on. Mm -hmm. That's what strengthened us. And pot liquor is that liquid that is left behind the meats and the vegetables, particularly the greens juice. and things, the juice. And we learned a long time ago that that's where the nutrients were. And then we perhaps pick up a handful of cornmeal or flour and dump that in there and give it some sort of, you know, consistency, some substance. So we have some strength. And that's what pot liquor is. Mm -hmm. Now, your young people sitting over there looking bright and eager and perhaps some of you have already hit that first romance for a second or third. When I first fall in love, the first time ever I saw your face, I felt the earth move. love 
that sometimes confuses us in terms of how we're supposed to operate with our children. And this particular one is one that I wrote, but not quite like the brother who just wrote his upstairs, but it was just before I did a presentation a few months ago for a group of educators. And this one, I want to dedicate particularly to our parents and to young people who one day will become parents. And it's called Ain't He Cute? And it's a very simple kind of poem. Whatever happened to that old time way? Think about it every day. Things just ain't the way they used to be. Mm, mm, mm. He sure was a cute baby, ain't he? Mm-hmm. And ooh-wee, look at him crawling and getting into everything. Ain't he cute? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm, child. I'm so broke. Bought up that mall. I want my baby to have everything when he can get it, because I just couldn't have all those things when I was a child. And I don't believe in buying him no cheap stuff either. I heard that. Whatever happened to that old time way? Think about it every day. <laughs> oh, honey, daycare teacher, come talking about he won't stop hitting and biting on the other kids. I don't know why she can't control him. Come calling me at work. I tell you. <laughs> And let me tell you, he's growing so fast, I can't buy clothes fast enough. And you know, he won't even wear some of the stuff I bought him the other day at Penny's. Mm. Have the nerve to get an attitude. Wouldn't even talk to me. Wouldn't even clean up his room. So, okay, I just gave up and went on down to Dayton's and got him some Tommy Hill figures. I know what you mean. Hmm. Whatever happened to that old time way? You know, his principal called me today, talking about we need to find some kind of alternative school because he can't seem to adjust to authority in a normal setting. I don't know what's wrong with these teachers today. Me neither, child. Me neither. Whatever happened to that old time way? Talk about it every day. Things just ain't the way they used to be. Thank you. But our children are definitely a part of our present. They're not necessarily the future, as we always hear. They are indeed our present, our now. But there's so much that we have to do with them now in order to make them prepared for the, for the future. We have the privilege of working with a very dynamic group of young people. Sister Toni Carter, who came up here first, this idea was her vision several years ago of getting young children involved in storytelling, in the oral tradition, passing it on, keeping that story, our history, alive. So I'd like to introduce to you a portion of our Arts Us Young Storytellers. This is their second presentation today, so they're kind of a little tired, but I really do appreciate the parents bringing them out and hanging, out, hanging in there with us. So please welcome the Arts Us Young Storytellers. Next morning, the mule woke up, 
and smelled them oats, and he just started to eat. Wasn't even looking where he was going, so when he got to the hole, he fell in. Now, most people like me, it was hatred and trap, right? So he started making all this stuff, and I'm like, hee haw, hee haw, jumping crazy, and the farmer heard him. He was so happy, he ran outside, grabbed his show, and started digging up dirt and throwing it on his back. Digging and throwing, digging and throwing so fast, his shovel caught on fire. <laughs> now, most people know that we was hate to have stuff on their back, so what do you think he was doing? By the farmer was throwing stuff on his back. Shake it off. He was shaking it off and stomping it down. Do y'all know what I mean? Uh -huh. He was shaking Shake it, it off and stomping it, it down. down. And he rolled level to the ground. And he kicked that farmer to next week. And for all I know, he's still climbing on there somewhere. And the my story is, if somebody's teasing you, messing with you, what should you do? Shake, Shake it off and stomping it down. down. And rise up to the ground? No, as high as possible. My name is Stacy Wilson, and the title of my story is Trees. A long time ago, when the sun was passing over a meadow, he saw two trees. One was a big, huge, old, gnarled tree, and the other one was a young, weak sapling. And the sun, deciding to be nice, told the, told the two trees, about a terrible storm that was coming that evening. He said, did you hear? There's a terrible storm, the worst that's been here in 500 years. Well, that big old tree, he turned his head and he said, I don't need to worry about that. I've been here for 600 years. I can get through anything. Well, the little tree, he thought about it and he said, thank you, thank you, I'm gonna get prepared. And he dug his roots deep in the ground and he told the grass to hold on with all of its might. And when that storm came by, it was the worst in a thousand years. And it was terrible, and everything was wrecked. And that the next day, when the sun came over the meadow, he saw that big old tree laying on his side dead. But he saw the little tree standing tall. And he said, how is it you stood, and this big tree is dead? And the little tree said one simple thing. I was prepared. And the moral to my story is, you can get through the worst situations, no matter how big or small, as long as you're prepared. Mm.
the medicine, but there's one thing that you can't do. You can't open the green door at the east end of the palace. And the farmer said, oh, no, I got this old palace. Why would I want to worry about a little green door? And the king said, OK, thank you. So the king went on his trip. Well, the farmer kind of didn't have anything to do in the palace. He couldn't leave the outside walls because people were afraid he'd get killed. And so he, the man found himself going into the east side of the palace and in front of that green door left. The man said, hmm. And he found himself about to open it. He said, no, no, the king doesn't want to. So one day, he found himself in front of the door again. And he said, hmm. Now, the king is my brother. And he asked me to take care of the palace. So in order for me to take care of the palace, I guess I'd have to know what was behind this green door. So the man said, yeah, that's good. So he opened up the green door just a little bit. And he looked inside, and it was real dark. And he opened up some more. He felt on the side, and he clicked on the light, and all there was was old rags and all this dust. But all of a sudden, a little mouse squeaked right out the door. And the farmer said, oh no, that was the king's pet mouse. That's what he wanted to stay inside the green door. So he shut the door, and he started running after the mouse inside the whole house. Now while he was running, the man got really hot. So he took off his robe, and he started running again. Well, he found himself slipping on the palace, so he took off his shoes. And he kept running after the mouse until he slipped again. And he fell into his big pair of legs. And he looked up, and it was the king. And the king said, brother, what, what are you doing naked running around in the palace? <laughs> and the man said, well, I, I, I was chasing your pet mouse that, was, that lived inside the green door. And the, and the king said, what? I have no pet mouse. And what were you doing inside the green door? And the farmer looked down. And the king said, I told you not to go behind the green door. And you disobeyed me. You are worse than Adam in the Garden of Eden. I want you out of the palace and back to your home. And the farmer said, I understand. And he went back home. And he woke up the very next day, got his axe went out to the forest, chopped down the wood, wrapped up his logs, went to the market, and said, logs, logs, logs for sale. And from that day forth, he never, ever mentioned Adam again. Thank you. <laughs>
How can I explain this feeling? You see, it's not like anything I've quite felt before. I mean, it's a bit spectacular, this feeling for you. It's as if the fog has lifted and I can see, oh, so clearly now. You see, it's not like anything I've quite felt before. I mean, I want all your time, all attention, and all kisses right now and forever, it seems. And it does overwhelm me. You overwhelm me. You see, it's not like anything I've quite felt before. How can I explain this feeling? Let me tell you a little bit about me. I am Trina Bolden, a junior here at Augsburg College, who is the co-chair of the Pan-African Student Union. I am somebody, and I am Pan-African. And I'm wondering, have you got enough of me? Oh, I see. You haven't got enough of me. Well, as I stood there and watched your pretty brown eyes and rage with me over account of not knowing me, I thought, this must be destiny. Because how can someone be so mad at a person to a point where they cannot speak, but as time goes on and you become strong, you see, you just didn't get enough of me. Was there something in the way that I dressed or in the, or in the way that I pressed on and on that drew you to me? Tell me, have you got enough of me? Was it my hair or my brown skin? If you dare, simply because I'm African. Was it my walk, my talk, or my inner being as you thought? Tell me, have you, have you got enough of me? Was it my touch or my kiss? <clears throat> Is that what you missed? Tell me, have you got enough of me? Was it my stilo or laying on my pillow? Is that the dealio? Tell me, have you got enough of me? Well, I see you stop by to say hi. Oh, you haven't got enough of me. I asked uh, one of our students to read a, sh a short something that I found uh, of Anita's from a long time ago. It's, it's, it's really short, it's really to the point, and it's one of those uh, little things that we're going to try to do more of to remember who Anita was and, and who she still is with us. So I'm going to ask Aika Temu, who is a sophomore from Tanzania, to come up and share the uh, quick words that are written by Anita. African American Fragments by Langston Hughes. Mm, mm, mm. So long, so far away is Africa. Not even memories alive, save those that history books create, save those that songs beat back into the blood, beat out of blood with word sad song, in strange, un-Negro tongue. So long, so far away is Africa. Subdued and time-lost are the drums, and yet, through some vast mist of race, 
there comes this song. I do not understand this song of atavistic lands of bitter yearning lost without a place. So long, so far away is Africa's dark place. But in order for us to achieve, we have to have our dreams. So I say, to fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till the white day is done, then rest at cool evening beneath a tall tree, while, not, while night comes on gently, dark like me. That is my dream, to fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance and whirl and whirl till the quick day is done, and rest at pale evening, a tall slim tree, night come tenderly, black like me. In trying to think of what to say or do tonight, one sort of anticipates the audience. And as storytellers, we seek to not just entertain, but in most cases we try to promote how communities should live together, how communi communities should share together. And a community cannot share unless it has dreams. You see, dreams are the things that make us strong. And when we lose our dreams, we sometimes lose our way. There's a story that I've been working on that I like to tell young people to try to get them to try to think for themselves, to try to be better people. But sometimes we lose our way. And then if we don't have a, a mentor or somebody to lead us on, we lose ourselves. And this story is about a chicken farmer. There were two chicken farmers. And the price of chicken had been going down. And these chicken farmers decided, you know, how can we save ourselves? How can we overcome? And the chicken farmer said, you know, I was up in the mountains. And while I was up in the mountains, I saw this eagle. And you know, people love eagles. So why don't you go up there and catch that eagle? And you know you have this cage over here, and if you get that eagle and put it in the cage, you will be able to charge it a mission. And a mission price, and people will come and see a cage eagle. And that will protect you from your losses. Well, the farmer thought that was a silly idea, but the farmer also wanted money too. So he went up and he found the eagle's nest. And so he fashioned a snare. And when the eagle flew back, the eagle got caught in that snare. And after many days, the farmer came and he got that eagle and he brought the eagle down. Down off of that tall mountain, down around where us coming folks are. And he decided to cage that eagle. But you see, eagles 
are birds of the air. They are the ones that have soared above all things. And when he sought to put the eagle into that cage, the eagle fought with all her might. She clawed, she pecked. She fought for her dear life. And the farmer, worried about his life, began to pound that eagle. He pounded and pounded and pounded and pounded that eagle until that eagle lay dead on the ground. His friends soon came back and, and he saw the eagle and he said, what happened? He said, I was trying to get the eagle into this cage and the eagle struggled so hard as if life, as if her life was over. And she fought me and I had to fight back and as we fought, she tried so hard that I had to kill her. And that's that. Well, the farmer said, what are you going to do now? You know, the price of chickens have gone down, and unless you do something, we're going to starve. Well, they put their heads together, and they thought some more, and thought some more, until the guy got the idea. He said, you know, I bet you, in that nest were a couple of eggs. And if you go up there and get those eggs and bring them down and put them under your best setting hen, when those eggs catch, hatch, you can just put it in the, in the cage and then you, know, you can charge admission. <coughs> well, the farmer thought that was a simple way of doing it, so he went back up there and he got those eggs. And there were two eggs. And he brought the eggs down, and he got his best setting hen, and he put the chicken, or the hen, on top of the eggs. And it sat a while. It sat for a long while until one day, one of the eggs decided to break out. And he pecked here and pecked here, and Soon he came out, and not knowing who he was or where he came from, he began to act like the things around him. And the only things that were around him that he could emulate were those chickens. So he started to peck on the ground and peck on the ground. He started pecking on the ground just like them chickens. And he began to act like a chicken. Until one day he happened upon a petal or a puddle of water. And as he looked at the water, and then he looked at the other chickens, he looked and he didn't look like them. And he grew ashamed. Because he only knew about what he had known or what he was around. And so he started to devise ways so that he could look just like all the other chickens. First he looked at his hair and it kind of stuck up sort of like a crown. But when he looked at the other chickens, he saw their hair wasn't the way his hair was. So he looked around until he got himself some hair relaxer. You know, we call it Jerry Curl. And he started to put his hair down just like that so that he could be just like all the other chickens. But then he looked at his skin, and his skin was kind of dark. 
So he got himself some porcelain cream and started to dab it on so he could lighten his skin so that he could look like all the other chickens. We'll call him Tom Chicken. Well, Tom Chicken, he was just walking around, pecking in the ground and pecking in the ground, being just like all the other chickens. But soon after that, you know, back where that hen was sitting, came out this other bird. And he was not like his brother Tom. He was kind of strong. He sort of broke out of that egg, all rough and tumble. And then he started looking around, and he started looking at the birds pecking on the ground. Well, no sooner as he had broken out of the egg, his brother came running over to him and said, hey, why are you acting so crazy? Don't you know who you are? He said, well, I just woke up and tell me who I am. He said, well, you're a chicken. What's a chicken? He said, you know, like those birds over there. Just act like them and you'll be okay. But you see, he looked at them. And he looked at them pecking on the ground. And something told him that he didn't want to peck on no ground. That his sights were on a higher plane. So he just would strut around, kind of proud. And his brother said, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. You better start emulating like, you know, like everybody else, or they're going to know you're different. Well, he said, well, I like being different. Well, he said, well, you know, your hair looks kind of nappy there. He said, why don't you come over here and I'll give you some of this stuff. You can put it on your hair and you can look like those chickens. He said, well, no, no, no. He said, I like the way I look because my hair is fine. My hair is natural. He said, well, hey, look at your skin. It's all brown and dirty. Take some of this cream and put it on it. And you can be, you know, like other chickens. And he said, I like the way I look. I like who I am. And I don't think I need to do that. Well, we'll call him Turk. Because Turk was bad. Turk dreamed. He dreamed of high things, and one day he was out in the meadow, and he was looking up in the sky, and he saw something there. And boy, was it flying. It was flying so high, and it just spiraled down and, and spiraled down until it landed on the tree under which Turk was sitting. Well, he was sitting there and, and he saw that bird. And the bird saw him and he said, hey brother, what you doing down there on the ground? He said, I don't know. I'm just sitting here. He said, well, you're a bird of the air. Come up and join me. He said, come up and join you. I can't fly. And he said, why can't you fly? He said, I don't know. He said, don't you know you're an eagle? He said, an eagle? 
Well, my brother been telling me I'm a chicken. Aren't I a chicken? He said, no, you're not a chicken, you're an eagle. Now fly up here with me, and I will tell you about your people. He said, fly up there? How can I get up there? He said, boy, just flap your wings. And that's what he did, because he started to flap his wings, and as he was flapping his wings, he could feel himself lifting. He flapped some more, and he was lifting higher. And then he kept flapping and flapping and flapping until soon he was up on the tree with that old eagle. Now that old eagle sat there and said, you know, do you know who your people are? Do you know who your people are? He said, no, I don't know my people. He said, your people your mother and your father were the kings and queens of the air. They have flown great distances. They have hovered in the air. And that's what you are. He said, come fly with me and I will show you things I will show you possibilities that you may have never dreamed of. Come fly with me. He said, but, 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 uh, um, what about my brother? Can I go back and tell him who we are? He said, you can try that. But you see, your brothers has been conditioned. He has been with the chickens too long. And no matter how hard you try to change him, you may not be able to. Maybe at a later time you can come back when you have gained the experiences that you need. And maybe through letting him see you walk your path, he may decide to follow you. But until that day, come fly with me. And so they began that journey, and they began to fly. They flew high into the sky, and as they were flying over the sky, that eagle felt like he could soar. And so he did. He was flying and not realizing where he was until he looked down at the valley. Well, when he looked at the valley and looked at how high he was, he began to, to falter. He began to not know which way to go. He almost lost his way. He said, what do I do now? I am so high, I might fall. And that valley is so deep that if I fall, I will never be able to rise again. <clears throat> but that eagle flew next to him. And he said, you know, that's just the valley of oppression. If you just flap harder, you can fly over it. Just keep flapping your wings. Keep flapping your wings and you can overcome it. Well, he overcame that. But no sooner than you get out of one obstacle, you fall into another. This time he was flying over the desert. And as you are in the desert, because of how hot it is, the air currents just cause problems. And he was flying through it, and he ran into climates that he had never, ever ran into. And it unnerved him. 
And he grew tired. And he said to the bird, he said, what do we do now? We are so far out. Do we turn around? He said, no, we don't turn around. We just keep flying. You see, this is just the desert of mediocrity. The desert of C minuses. The desert of I don't care. If you keep flying, keep going, you will overcome that desert. There may be some dry times in your life, but if you keep just flying, you can overcome it. And he began to fly proud. He began to fly like that eagle until he saw another obstacle. And he started flying, and as he got closer and closer, it was as if it was a sheer cliff. And he said, what do we do now? If we keep going, we're going to just crash into it. Well, the ego said, what we do is we fly above it. We fly high now. We use all the strength we can, and we fly over it. For what you see before you is just the mountain of injustice. There is going to be injustice always in your life. And what you have to do is you have to remember who you are. And so you fly high. And he began to fly. He began to fly higher and higher and higher until he overcame that mountain. And he rested a while and grew strong and dreamed of possibility. He is flying now. He is flying like you are today. And he sings his song. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. See me running through an open door. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. And so tonight, what this event is about is flying high. I tell all people that we all are storytellers. That each and every one of us has a story to tell. When I am with children sometimes telling stories, I always end with a riddle. And I always say, why is it that in all the stories told by the warriors, the lions always lose. And the children usually will say things like, well, because they're lying? And I said, no, that's not the answer. They said, well, is it because the, the warriors, they have the weapons and, 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 and they're stronger? I said, no, that's not the answer. They said, well, um, is it because the lion is so boastful and they, you know, they go out there and they try to triumph and they get themselves killed? I said, no. I say, listen again. Why is it that in all the stories told by the warriors, 
the lions always lose. And by that time they get all quiet. And then I say to them, it will always be true until the lions start telling the stories. Because each of you are lions. You must begin to tell your story. Because if you don't tell your story, there's usually somebody out there who will tell your story. But they will only tell it the way that makes them look great. And as I always say, that's the truth. And that's a fact, because I would never tell you a fib. <laughs> Hanging out with us, sharing with us. Keep, keep learning them stories, keep telling them stories, keep sharing a word, the word that has meaning not just to you or to your community, but people who are over to hear. I want to thank those uh, students of ours from the Pineapple Student Union who shared some poetry with Nisha, Trina, and George. I want to thank, uh, definitely thank Rose uh, and, 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 and Tony, who uh, really have worked diligently with the young black storytellers, as well as just keeping the notion of the word alive and the various expressions that God has gifted us to bring. And I want to thank Jeff and Gary Blue for coming out and sharing that story. Now, we're going to close out. Some of y'all don't know how we do, but in the Pan the Student Union, we have a tradition of closing out our intimate programs like this by joining in the circle, grabbing hands, and it was something that Nita had started over, over the years, and we always end our, poll, our, our, our sessions like this with what? Seven? Harambe. Harambe.
He's always supposed to be covered. Thank you for coming out.